At the core of the Witcher narrative lies Geralt of Rivia, a prominent figure in this fantastical realm created by Andrei Sapkowski. Witchers, a distinct group of individuals, dedicate themselves to hunting down monsters and creatures that ordinary humans are ill-prepared to face. These remarkable beings travel across the unnamed piece of land called the Continent, offering their specialized services in exchange for money. Naturally, the Witchers are not ordinary humans, but rather a select group of mutated humans who have, in the past, shown some relation with magic, even if it was trivial. Their extraordinary abilities are a result of transformative alchemy, due to which the Witchers undergo several physiological and psychological changes. In this video, we will explore the top 10 anatomical facts of these monster-killing machines. Let's draw our silver swords and get the slaying started. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you, let's begin. Who are witchers? Are they born? The oversimplified answer to this question would be that witchers are not necessarily born, but are made or created. But as I said, it's an oversimplification, and there are several layers to the creation of a witcher. So let's start with the creation of the first ever witcher or as some call it, the Witcher prototype. More than 12 centuries prior to the events of the Witcher series, the world didn't really know monsters until the chief druid sage named Baylor summoned a monster from another plane of existence to assassinate the elven royalty. Following this, the celestial twins, Sindril and Zakair, knew that they had to make use of the ritual that could merge an individual's physiology with that of a monstrous being. Given the former enhanced abilities to fight and even defeat the monster, this this very ritual was the primitive version of the trial of grasses. It required that a subject gathers and ingests a variety of herbs that would break the subject's body down so that the internal physiology becomes open to react positively to the next stage, which was drinking potions. Now, the first person to undergo this ritual was Fiel, a disgraced elven warrior. Immediately after the process was finished, Fiel gained the attributes of the monster's physiology, changing his pallor, eye color, and more. Furthermore, he awoke with an entirely new and feral personality, and that's how the first of the continent's monster hunters was born. But since this entity was so unstable and violent, the Witcher prototype had to be killed. And although the otherworldly monster was defeated, new monsters came into existence, and so did the need for more monster hunters. After this point, the mages and others spent the following centuries perfecting the ritual of Sindril and Zakair. A number of Witcher schools came up that based their training of their Witchers on specific animals like bears, cranes, cats, wolves, vipers, and more. Each school had its specific kind of mutagens and elixirs to turn young boys into monster-killing machines. But one important thing to note is that the induction of the young boys in Witcher training came much later. Initially, it was young men who were introduced to the training. However, their bodies and minds were not as impressionable and transformable as a young boy's. The modern method of Witcher creation includes a series of trials or experimental procedures that alter the subject's body and mind. The most important, crucial, and riskiest of which is the trial of grasses. It's so dangerous and painful that less than three out of 10 candidates survive. Witchers age slow, but exactly how slow do they verge on immortality? Firstly, time works a bit differently in the Witcher universe. I mean, even in the show, a few arcs span several decades, while others may just last one. This is why some often believe that Witchers stay young for extended periods of time, but that's not really the reason. Witchers age slowly because of the mutagens they consume during their trials. For instance, in the Netflix version, Geralt is 71 at the beginning of the first season and ends the season at the age of 150, but that doesn't mean they're immortal. However, they do age extremely slowly. Even the source material authorized by Andrei Sapskowski doesn't offer much of an answer about how long witchers can stay alive, but that doesn't mean we will shy away from drawing conclusions. In Sapkowski's book, titled Blood of Elves, Triss and Geralt meet again at Karamoran after many years. Triss notices that Geralt is showing signs of slight aging, which surprises her because usually 
A human doesn't notice the change in a witcher's age. So yeah, it's that slow. Nevertheless, the book goes on to mention that even though the mutation holds back the physical process of aging, it doesn't alter the mental aging. It's believed that the oldest witcher ever was Vesemir, who lived close to 350 years before having his neck snapped. But he looked like someone in his 50s. Having said that, he was much more agile and fitter than a normal human of 50. This was because the mutagens reduced the degenerative effect of aging. Aging. In other words, growth and development are not hindered, as cells multiply rapidly, but the DNA doesn't exacerbate, and the witchers maintain prime mental and physical condition. That's cool. Do all witchers have yellow eyes and white hair? Titled Kyre Morin, the third episode of The Witcher's second season, introduced an entire clan of 12 witchers residing at the nearly impenetrable castle. Now, prior to this, we had only seen Geralt as the brooding witcher with glowing eyes and white hair, which earned him the name of White Wolf from his hair and his school. However, the other witchers do not possess Geralt's iconic pigmentation and hair color. I mean, Lambert's a redhead who has brown eyes, Cohen's beard is black, while Eskel has blue eyes. Only Geralt's old teacher and mentor, Vesemir, resembles Geralt. Why is that? Well, Geralt's condition is the result of the excessive mutagenic substances that he was given during the trial of grasses. And even after that, it seemed that Geralt's body could process the mutagenic potions quite well. So the mages experimented by giving him more of the substances, which basically burned the color of his hair and transform the pigmentation of his eyes. Unfortunately, all of this excess mutagens has caused Geralt to sometimes experience hallucinations. <laughs> The Witcher's eyes and their night vision ability. All the Witchers have beautiful eye colors that some often consider magical, while others think of them as animalistic. As far as Geralt is concerned, his eyes have a glowing yellow tinge, and the books describe his eyes to be a yellowish green, which is similar to the eye color that most cats have. Additionally, Geralt's eyes have vertical pupils, another feline trait. But not just Geralt, even Cohen, a relatively younger witcher, also has vertical slits. Now these glowing eyes appear to be reflective, but when they're exposed to bright light, such as sunlight, the pupils turn into vertical slits. And much like a cat's eye, the eyes of a witcher adapt themselves to see better in darkness. When there's a lack of light, a witcher like Geralt's pupils would dilate, thus absorbing more light, which in turn helps the witcher see better. But why do a witcher's eyes in the surrounding area turn pitch black sometimes? Well, this usually happens when his sense of smell, sight, touch, etc., are at their peak after consuming witcher potions. This also happens with cats when they experience an adrenaline rush or are angry. Basically, when a witcher consumes a potion, two things happen. First, the toxicity of the potion turns the veins black and they become more pronounced when seen in the contrast with the skin. And second, the witcher's eyes go into full dilation, so much so that the pupils take up the space of the iris, absorbing much more light, giving them a super enhanced vision. They have heightened senses and superhuman strength. The trials conducted during the transformation process grant witchers with an unparalleled sensory perception. Their senses become finely tuned, allowing them to detect and perceive things that would elude an ordinary human. We have seen several times in the shows that witchers possess an exceptional ability to track down foes and missing individuals, aided by their acute hearing, which enables them to discern even the faintest of sounds from great distances. Additionally, their enhanced sense of smell and empowers them to identify various beings based on a small sample of their blood. Furthermore, as I spoke about in previous entries, witchers are capable of seeing in the dark with greater clarity than an average human, making them proficient in environments with limited lighting. But of course, that's not all. One of the most remarkable attributes of witchers is their superhuman strength. They possess exceptional strength, speed, reflexes, and endurance that surpass the capabilities of humans, ordinary or well-trained. When combined with their extensive training and appropriate weaponry, witchers can single-handedly overcome most monsters. Naturally, witchers have demonstrated the ability to withstand blows that would render normal humans unconscious or even dead. I mean, surviving attacks from powerful creatures such as giants and other beings is not exactly a walk in the park. The amalgamation of heightened senses and superhuman abilities proves invaluable to witchers in their day job of making the continent a safer place, one monster at a time.
Witcher's Unique Blood The blood of witchers possesses distinct characteristics due to the intensive chemical procedures they endure. As a result, a witcher's blood exhibits several remarkable properties. One of the most notable attributes of witcher blood is its toxicity to certain creatures. The mutagens and other compounds present in a witcher's bloodstream render their blood harmful or repellent to specific monsters. For instance, creatures such as vampires, who typically feed on human blood, can be adversely affected or deterred by the presence of witcher blood. The alterations to a witcher's blood contribute to their accelerated healing capabilities. Compared to regular humans, witchers demonstrate a significantly enhanced ability to recover from injuries at a rapid pace, thus allowing them to heal more swiftly and efficiently. The modifications in a witcher's blood afford them immunity to diseases that would afflict ordinary humans. Not only does a witcher have no care about the common cold or flu, but the immunity is also indispensable in their dangerous line of work. Furthermore, witcher blood possesses the capacity to process and tolerate these potent substances, such as witcher potions, without immediate harm. However, there may be potential long-term health effects associated with constant consumption, but the precise nature and extent of such consequences vary. Why can't witchers reproduce? According to the lore of the witcher universe, the process of becoming a witcher doesn't inherently render an individual infertile, nor does it essentially require one to become infertile. However, certain factors associated with the transformation and the subsequent lifestyle of a witcher can potentially affect their reproductive capabilities. The transformation process involved in creating a witcher can have significant impacts on various aspects of the individual's physiology, including their reproductive system. While the precise mechanisms and effects of these mutations remain ambiguous, it is suggested that they may influence the hormonal balance and fertility of witchers. But then again, a witcher's libido is higher than most of us, or maybe all of us. Furthermore, the nomadic and perilous nature of a witcher's existence is not conducive to forming and maintaining familial relationships. Witchers lead a transient lifestyle, frequently undertaking dangerous contracts and facing constant threats. Their societal status often marks marginalizes them, making it challenging to establish meaningful partnerships and settle down to raise a family. But is there a possibility that they can reproduce? Having said that, there's a small reason why there's a possibility that witchers can, in fact, reproduce. In the second game, a couple of alchemists named Gaspar and Farid approach Geralt with a request to drink a potion that would show results years later. This was an experiment they were conducting, and if the player agreed to it, the alchemist would simply thank Geralt and be on their way. This arc would continue in the third game, as a letter would reveal to Geralt that if the potion that Gaspar and Farid gave to Geralt did, in fact, have the capacity to cure sterility caused by magic or alchemy. How do you tell if someone's a witcher? Well, there could be so many factors that can scream about a person being a witcher. Let's explore a few of these. Glowing eyes, medallions, silver and steel swords, resistance to alchemy, enhanced senses, superior physical abilities, resistance to diseases, slow aging, monster hunting, and of course, pleasing women. While some of these may also be found in some humans, the chance of such a human being a witcher is fairly higher. Why have only males been selected and successfully transformed into witchers? The selection and successful transformation of only males into witchers is rooted in many factors. The primary reason lies in the design of the Trial of the Grasses, a crucial part of the witcher transformation process. This trial was specifically formulated to work on boys and men. Women possess a different hormonal composition than men, making it necessary to conduct new research and develop tailored procedures if a trial of the grasses were to be administered to women. However, due to the low demand for societal perception of male witchers, it's unlikely that the magus cared much about getting women in. The gender asymmetry in the selection of candidates for witcher transformation can be theorized to stem from the stronger adrenal response typically found in men. In real life, such gender asymmetry in adrenal response is observed among athletes, such as in weightlifting, where men tend to display maximum strength in the one to three reps, while women excel in the five reps range. Now, while this may come off as sexist or misogynistic from a macro point of view, the author probably had other thoughts in mind. Andrei Savkovsky may not have harbored malice or ill intent, 
but it's valid to critique aspects of the media we consume, even if we enjoy the work as a whole. The portrayal of women being inherently weaker or biologically predisposed to failing the trials can be seen as misogynistic, regardless of the author's intent. Interestingly, though, several schools, like the School of Cat, did include women and even non-humans in the training process. Having said that, I would still say that a work of art should be seen as a work of art, but then again, it's a very subjective and gray area. But what's the popular opinion? Should we have an intelligent and well-informed debate? And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks, everyone.